it's just great. Everybody in the community is just like, so like, let's talk about how we can make the world a better place, you know? And, and of course, you know, we get into to Bitcoin because of number go up originally. I was, I was like, cool, how can I make some money? But then I saw freedom go up and love go up and peace go up. And I was like, dude, okay, what is this stuff? You know? So I think it's so important that we understand the connection between having stability and the sound money and how it impacts our relationships, how it impacts our health, our physical and our mind and our spiritual health. You know, how is it impacting our social relationships and our uh, community relationships? How is it impacting the choices that we make for the, the dreams that we're going to go pursue or not pursue, you know, and feel like, are we trapped? Are we hopeless and, and, you know, in this cage, or do we have a pathway towards a prosperous and peaceful planet for all, which I believe we do with Bitcoin. We're back for another episode, my friends. Today I have one of the most wonderful, beautiful souls I have ever come across in this world. Her name is DJ Valerie B. Love, which is also one of the coolest names I've ever had on. Uh, we met, it was 2023 Pacific Bitcoin is where we ran yep. into each other. And uh, Was it 23 were, or 22? I was, I was just wondering that earlier. I feel like it was 23. It seems like it was two years ago, but we're almost to 2025. So I, I think we're our, our views of time are starting to change because we're about to hit a new year. We're only a couple months out. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, right. I was in Los Angeles area. Everyone super stoked to learn about Bitcoin. And I see this, this woman just covered in like orange and pink dress. <laughs> and you, pr I think you have something on your head too. Like you're just like covered in bright, vivid colors. And I love this so much. And you were just always the most vibrant person there. And I think that is so wonderful. And we like to bring bright humans onto my podcast. So I had to bring Yay. you on. Thank you so much for coming, Valerie. I appreciate oh you being God. here. Oh my God. Thank you so much for inviting <laughs> me and acknowledging my weirdness and, you know, not being scared of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so much fun. I mean, oh my gosh, I wish they were doing Pacific Bitcoin this year, but I know they they're they're doing the thing in Santa Monica though, which is going to be amazing. So peer to peer, like so I don't know if you know what they're doing there. What? Um I've never heard of that. Yeah, what is this? like it's a new thing. Well, it's kind of the spinoff because Swan, you know, kind of had to downsize a little bit this year for Pacific and um uh, Dom Bay, you know, who works with the Santa Monica Fire Department, he got the whole city of Santa Monica to start, you know, looking at Bitcoin for their uh, treasury and all the other things. So I don't know exactly all the details of what the city is doing, but they're co-sponsoring the event. And so, you know, they're, it's like a spinoff. Swan's still doing some wonderful stuff because they're awesome. Um, but they're going to have all sorts of neat stuff, like Terrence Michaels helping out. There's a whole crew of people and they're doing all these like little educational experiences and fun. And it's just, it's such a treat to see like, well, if this isn't going to work out, okay, well, what can we take from it and kind of mold and go do this? And so it's like this open source event vibe, right? And so the it's show just must so go cool because Bitcoiners are like, fuck it, we're doing it. Am I allowed to swear in your podcast? Absolutely. <laughs> Sorry. The more the better. Okay. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> I know, but I, re I remember where we were talking, we were talking, uh, in like the vendor area and talking about doing some stuff. So finally, oh my God, I'm so grateful to be here with you. So thank you again for, for having me. <laughs> yes, that, that is, I have not even heard of that. So there, there's too many events to even keep track of right now. They're happening everywhere all the time. And at this point, I, I, I'm recommending to everyone all the time to just go to these Bitcoin meetups and start making connections because you're going to meet awesome people. And there is no excuse because totally. they are everywhere. They're even in just little random small towns all over the place. And if there isn't, you can start your own. It's super easy. Totally. And you feel like, you know, for me, like I have, I always get FOMO when I see everything that's going on because I want to go to every one of them. And they're like family reunions, you know, when we get to go jam and hang out with everybody. But it's such a treat to see so many little micro events happening and they don't need to be big conferences. They don't need to be big festivals. Like I'll be hosting, you know, starting doing a, um, a Bitcoin for women, you know, once a month event down in Denver at the Denver space, which is incredible. Like all these guys have put together their time, treasure and talent and got a physical location, kind of like Bitcoin park, Bitcoin commons, and uh, it's Bitcoin space. So I'm super excited to get to 
to participate. I was there like a week and a half ago. It's absolutely gorgeous. So anybody who's coming to Colorado, you guys have to come to the space. It's so badass. And uh, it's, I mean, it's really, really beautiful. I'm so like, I can't wait to see what kind of starts blossoming there. And it's so cool because it's just like, people decided, cool, we want to have our own social club. We need a physical space. Then these guys have been doing, you know, Denver bit devs and Denver Rocky mountain Bitcoiners and meetups and all this stuff. And they're finally like, why don't we get our own space? And so it's just such a cool community, you know, when people can just do things without like, I need to ask the CEO and go through HR and get a stamp of approval and all, you know? And <laughs> so, I mean, it's just, I love this community so much. I'm so honored and I keep learning more every day and get more impressed and more hopeful each day, you know, really thinking about the heart and the soul of Bitcoiners, you know, uh, and yeah. that to me is the coolest part of the network. And it's just the coolest thing ever. And so. as you mentioned, women in Bitcoin is this topic that I get so excited about because speaking of bringing heart and soul into it how, we can't do that if it's just a sausage fest <laughs> we, we, yeah. need, we need to bring some <laughs> some different some variety in here and of course that starts with women and ev everyone knows pretty much in bitcoin like it's it's quite male dominated and i'm so i'm excited to get into this with you why more women do need to understand why bitcoin is freaking awesome for you guys like it's totally. the coolest um, maybe before we dive into that, though, I would love to hear just some more of your backstory. This is sort of the, the thing that I try to get everyone to do. And I know that you have quite an interesting story just leading up to where you are right now. So could, could we get just a bit of a summary on the life of DJ Valerie Belove? How did she become this, this Bitcoin podcaster lady? <laughs> Well, I landed on planet Earth many, many decades ago. Um, <laughs> um, you know, I've always been somebody who, you know, believes in trying to make the world a better place and wanting to help people's dreams come true, right? And there's all these different ways that we can go about, like, living our best lives, living our dreams, you know, and I was on the 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 hamster wheel for just a second of corporate and you know i worked at deloitte and touche out of college it was such a hilarious experience i was like these are not my people <laughs> this is not what i'm supposed to be doing you know um but it's great to have that skill set as a businesswoman you know and it's served me well on my entrepreneurial journey um obviously i became a dj i was a charter boat captain i lived on a sailboat for three years and taught college kids sailing so that was crazy who the heck knows like Dude, I'm going here. I'm going to be a CPA and go get my law degree and go save the world. And then it was like, nope, I'm going to go live on a sailboat and go teach kids about their dreams while I'm teaching them knots, but I'm really teaching them about living their dreams. And so it was just all this crazy stuff, you know, happened. And, uh, and then I started getting interested in holistic health and wellness and I moved to San Diego and it was great, but it wasn't like paying the bills. And so I did go back to corporate a little bit and, I was miserable. I was like, shit, how am I supposed to be the person who helps people live their dreams while I got pantyhose on with fluorescent lights? Like, <laughs> these are still not the droids you're looking for, Val. And uh, <laughs> so I was pretty upset and miserable for a couple of years because I just couldn't find, you know, my special purpose. And uh, so the first time I know I'm a deadhead, you know, and I've done, you know, some psychedelics and mushrooms and acid and party and all these things, but I'd never taken ecstasy. And, uh, and I went to a club in Las Vegas with my girlfriends and they had tried to bring me to these techno clubs before and I hated it because it was just like one song for three hours. And I was like, this music sucks. There's no words, you know, what? Bleh, don't take me to this stuff. You know, I'm a deadhead. I like Motown. I like rock and roll. I like Prince, of course, you know. And uh, but I remember I was at this club and it was called Club Utopia. And, um, you know, we get there and I'm still in this kind of like, gosh, I want to go you know, at scale, help people live their dreams, you know, and I was studying Tony Robbins at the time. And this was back in the mid, you know, late eighties, or excuse me, late nineties, not eighties. Um, and I'm just like, there's no degree to go be this personal growth person, you know, and I want to work with young people because I think young people are so exciting, you know, because they change the world and they still have hope. And, um, and, I just was like, maybe I'll go back and get a master's degree. Maybe I'll go, you know, be a teacher and go be a professor. And then I was like, that's not scalable. You know, it wasn't, it was just this limited thing. And I'm like, I can't, that's not my jam. And, uh, but I remember sitting on the dance floor 
and ecstasy is starting to come on, you know, and there's this, this couple that's on stage called dub, their group is dub tribe and like sunshine and moonbeam are their names for real. And they're like playing drums and singing and DJ. And I was like, all right, I can get with this kind of music. It's kind of organic -y tribal, but it's still got some electronic stuff. But she kept singing the song. She kept singing, you are beautiful. You are perfect. Just the way you are. And she kept singing it. And I'm sitting there having a battle with her in my head. And I was like, no, I'm not. I suck. I don't have my life together. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And she kept singing, you are beautiful. And I'm like, no, I'm not. And it was like this war going on, right? And and the ecstasy's coming on. She's singing. She won't shut up, you know, and she keeps singing this beautiful song. And I'm like, yeah. And <laughs> finally, this 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 war that in, was going on in my head with my ego, you know, that was just battering me. It just melted and she won and those words won. And it was so beautiful. Cause it was just like, Oh, I am beautiful and perfect. Just the way I am. I'm not a disaster. It's okay. I'll, I'm, I'm going to figure this out. It's all good. And it was just like, everything just melted away. All of that fear, all of that anxiety, all of that resistance, you know? And, um, thinking that I had to have all the answers and be perfect, realizing I'm God's child. I'm perfect just the way I am. God, spirit, universe, whatever you call that, this creative life force. And it was just right then and there in the dance floor. It was like, I grabbed my girlfriends and they knew what I was going through. They knew the hell that I'd been in for a couple of years, just mentally rah, mind mosquitoes. And I was like, I'm going to be a DJ. <laughs> You want to give I, that same experience to new people, pass on the love. Exactly. Yeah. Cause I was like, if this woman and this man sitting on stage can play this music with these beautiful words and totally transform this giant nuclear war that was going on inside of my mind, you know, it was like, what can I participate in and share? You know? And I thought about Bob Marley, get up, stand up, right? John Lennon, imagine. And you think about the consciousness shift that music has the impact for all of humanity and it's a culture shifter it's a a love shifter a heart shifter a soul shifter and i was just like holy moly this is scalable let's go do this you know <laughs> and so i didn't know how to dj i'm like i don't know and so i was like okay i better start asking people and so i just like learned and every dj i would go watch them and stand behind them at the dj booth and wait till the end i was like hi my name's valerie i'm learning how to dj could you give me one tip please and uh, <laughs> everyone was always so nice you know like hey do this do that you know and and so it was just this culmination of generosity of spirit with all these wonderful djs and uh and I would just integrate, okay, cool, I'm going to do this, do that. I'm going to have performers and stilt walkers and fire dancers and drummers and aerialists and we're all going to wear costumes. And okay, the budget's this, great, we're going to blow it on the show. Cool, we're going to get a VJ, awesome. And so it was just this layer upon layer of really, really fun, you know, turning our lives into this little Valerie and the Vibe Tribe was our name. And uh, we got to travel all over and bring the vibes, you know. And I met my, my co-parent, my ex-husband because of DJing. And it was so funny because I got to go back and DJ at that same location called Club Utopia a couple years later. Oh, and then, the dream. Right? Back and to where so it all was started. Just like That's so cool. Insane, right? And that night, my girlfriend, Veronica, my bestie, she was our head vibe tribe. Um, we, we, uh, she was still in her costume and I wanted to go home and go to bed. And they all went out and partied and they ended up meeting my ex and his friends because they were at some super after hours club. They exchanged business cards because like, why are you dressed like that? And she's like, where's Valerie in the right time? And uh, he ended up coming to San Francisco to see us play. And he was like, oh, this will be perfect for my housewarming party in Lake Tahoe. And they booked us and uh, or he booked us. And then five days later, he asked me to marry him. And we ended up staying married for 14 years. And then it didn't work out. And it was, that's totally cool. But then during COVID, it was like, and I was podcasting a little bit before all of this was going on, but just sort of dabbling and trying to figure out how to do dreams and talk about that. And, and then, um, uh, I had discovered Bitcoin, you know, and crypto, but my girlfriend had brought me to a blockchain conference, like, you know, probably six years ago, I'm, I'm guessing six, maybe five, six years ago. 
And, you know, she's like, ah, oh, this is so cool. It's crypto. It's, you can have a Val token. And, you know, Steve Wozniak was there and all this stuff. And it was just like this monster conference, you know? And I just looked at her. I was like, you know, this is bullshit, right? Like, this is like tokens. You can go to a video game arcade or you get like game points or airline miles or something like who the hell is going to buy a Val token or a U token, you know? And I just thought it was nonsense. And so I just didn't know the difference between Bitcoin and crypto and all of everything got just plopped in the same bucket. And then, you know, fast forward to COVID. And of course, I'm sitting there in my pajamas with YouTube on all by myself. I'm like, I need to make some money. <laughs> like, what am I going to do? And so I was like, maybe I'll be a crypto trader. That'll be great. And then I started watching all the stuff and, you know, shit coining for a couple of months. But then I saw, um, I've been, I was listening to Peter's show and heard Alex Gladstein talk about the human rights stuff and escaping authoritarian regime. And it was like, done, crypto, stupid. What's Bitcoin? And all I cared about was like, how can I be a part of, uh, this movement that can help people escape violence, can help them escape slavery, you know, physical violence, everything. And so I've been on that mission ever since. And so I'm a total student first, you know, and I just feel like I want to share things and be a megaphone and try to get more people understanding, especially people who are like artists, who are creatives, who are environmentalists, who are entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs, activists, like they're so... Um, so much opportunity for education because these people are change makers. You know, they're mission driven people. They're out there rocking the world. They're out there doing great missions, but they don't understand the money system. Nor did I, even though I, I worked at Deloitte, I started a couple of companies, you know, with my ex husband and he was the superstar. I'm the like visionary dreamer person, but he was an excellent ex executor. Um, but I didn't understand money. You know, I didn't know what the difference was fiat and what's hard money, what's sound money, what's the gold standard, what's all that stuff. They just, they don't teach you that stuff. They just teach you, you know, how to make a profit and how to go do things. And here's your balance sheet and da, 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 da. And, and why inflation is good for you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Keep printing more money. Growth is great. And it's just like, no, that's not. And so, of course, I read, you know, Safe's book, the Bitcoin standard, and just started really realizing, oh my gosh, I have so much to unlearn and relearn like a lot to unlearn and um, very humbling, of course, you know, but really one of the other things that really caught my attention, of course, was the 40, you know, this was obviously more money printing since COVID, but when they said there was a 40% increase in the money supply in the print, and I was just like, hold on a minute, let me, let me get this straight. Um, <laughs> you're telling me that you just printed all this money out of thin air. And so my purchasing power now has been completely just stolen out of my bank account. So instead of just taxing me, you did this thing, central banks, government. And, um, and I just couldn't understand, like, how, how can we not be talking about this? This is insane, you know, and we're going to have this, everyone's excited about their little $2,000 stimmy check. But I'm like, where is that coming from, my friends? It's, it's just, it's literally coming out of thin air, which means it's going to come out of your pocket in the future. And you're going to stay on this hamster wheel of inflation and debt. Um, and so, you know, my job is trying to synthesize bigger, complex ideas into something simple and, and understandable. And not only that, but how do we execute on these simple and understandable ideas in our daily lives, in our businesses, in our, you know, missions, projects, et cetera. And so I'm hoping that, you know, that's one of my special secret sauces. I'm not a genius or anything, but I am kind of polymath in a certain way. And I can take a bunch of things from different areas that I'm in, interested in and like pull them into something more like, here's your little nugget of how this affects this and this affects you and it affects your kids. Now it's going to affect their future, it affects their mental health and it's going to affect this and then that. So this is why Bitcoin. <laughs> so, um, so it's really cool. I just, it's such a, it's just great. Everybody in the community is just like, so like, let's talk about how we can make the world a better place, you know? And, and of course, you know, we get into to Bitcoin because of number go up originally. I was, I was like, cool, how can I make some money? But then I saw freedom go up and love go up. And I was like, and peace go up. And I was like, dude, okay, what is this stuff? You know, and I don't know about you, Ben, but I was brought up to believe that money was the root of all evil. 
you know, and I saw my family fall apart. My, my father and his mother stopped talking for till the day she died because of some stupid money dispute over like $800. And I'm like, really? You're going to let your family with your mother relationship go away because of some stupid money, you know? And so it's just that when the ego's in there and all this crazy stuff around money, I think it, it, it activates that primal survival thing. And we don't act with love. We don't act with care and compassion for each other when we're in that fight or flight fear mode. Um, so I think it's so important that we understand the connection between, you know, having stability and a sound money and how it impacts our relationships, how it impacts our health, our physical and our mind and our spiritual health. You know, how is it impacting our social relationships and our uh, community relationships? How is it impacting the choices that we make for the, the dreams that we're going to go pursue or not pursue, you know, and feel like, are we trapped? Are we hopeless and, and, you know, in this cage, or do we have a pathway towards a prosperous and peaceful planet for all, which I believe we do um, with Bitcoin. And I believe, you know, harmony is such a, you know, buzzword where people are like, Oh, that's all woo woo. No, it's not. No, it's not. Harmony is the goal. You know, I say freedom is a tool and peace is a goal. Harmony is the way. And so it's really, really important that people understand, you know, balance is bullshit. We're never going to have balance in life. That, that's called being dead. And so, you know, everything's constantly in a state of flux. You're rocking in this one area, but this area is not doing so great. Okay. You're rocking over here next month. And then this area is getting a little less attention. And so, so for all of us who are really exhausted from working in this system, you know, working in this toxic fiat system, uh, it's so important, I think, that we take care of our health holistically, uh, you know, our relational health, our resource health, uh, our health, of, of course, of self. Um, and when we can start to understand that it's all interconnected and money, sound money, or toxic cancerous poisonous money called fiat are either going to be, you know, the contributors to a, a more harmonious inner system and exterior system or a more toxic inner system or exterior system. So I think it's really important for us to keep remembering that it's all connected. There is no, none of this part of things called life don't touch each other. Every single part of life touches each other, each other. And so I really, really hope that, you know, with my mission and my obsession <laughs> that I could help people understand that so that they can start really realizing like, wow, you pull the lever here, this goes up over here and the ball drops here and da, 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 like the Rube Goldberg, right. Um, machine. And so I think it's super, uh, it's important to take it one step at a time. People's brains explode a lot of times when you start giving them all this new information. You know, I wrote an article called, uh, the Bitcoiners dilemma. You know, we talk, it talks about, you know, how you have to reframe your worldview, you reframe your relational view, you reframe, you know, the view with yourself. Uh, and it's very destabilizing mentally, you know, when you have to like let go of old things, especially things that you trusted in your life. You know what I mean? If you trusted that there was a, a system that was serving you, whether it was religious, whether it's political, whether it's governmental, whether it's business, whatever it might be. Um, you have to re look at things, you know, with a new lens and so people avoid that because they're just like, I'm too freaking busy. I don't want my world to collapse. Forget it. Nah, la, 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 la. I'm going to put my head in the sand. Um, and I get it. It's a lot. It's like, who the heck wants to go blow up their worldview? It's, 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 it's predictable. It's safe. It doesn't mean it's good or healthy or serving you, but at least you're in a state of, of, uh, kind of knowing what's around the corner, you know, and unfortunately this is very common for abuse victims. And so people will stay in toxic relationships, whether it's familial or, you know, marital, whatnot, business, people stay in bi toxic business relationships with a boss or with a par business partner because it's just familiar and they know how to navigate it, you know? And so instead of this, the, the uncertainty of the new, sometimes people opt for, well, it's not that bad. I'll just, this is okay. It could be worse. I'll just stay, you know, and I'm guilty of it in many different areas of my life. And, um, so, so I feel like having ultra compassion and empathy for people where they're at 
you know, and not judging and not this, oh, have fun staying poor. That bothers me when people say that. Like, I think it's kind of funny and cute for a second because my snarky teenager self thinks, haha, but it's like, no, not haha. Like, the math of love and the math of peace is not a zero sum game, it's infinite, you know? And so when I see people, you know, doing that, it's, it's off putting and it's very off putting to us as women. I think many of the women are just like, well, it's so bro and it's like women wouldn't say that to each other. Typically there might be some women out there who are, you know, a little catty or whatever, but like for the most part, we're not out there trying to knock each other down in this capacity. In other ways, people will be like, Oh, I can't believe she wore that. Oh, what is she thinking? Like girls do that, which I think is not okay either. Um, but it, it's just something like for all of us to pay attention to, I think men and women, you know, we all have our own little quirks in our genders and all that stuff. So, um, so yeah, blah, blah, blah. That was a lot of Valerie <laughs> waterfalling on you. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing all that. I absolutely love it. Uh, where to begin, man, so much to dig into there. I mean, just the, the fact that you are, I, I see you as someone who just goes through life and is always very absorbent to experiences and trying to, you know, take in these new ideas and be sort of a filter, like which of these can help other people. And you're always thinking about how can I like spread this love outward? And the, you talked through a couple of highlights. There are things that really hit you like, whoa, this is really going to help people. And that's what gets you excited. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. It, I'm the well, same way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, right. And you are. And it's like, that's like such a, a, it's, it's not that it's rare, but it's a beautiful thing to see. Like there are some people, and again, you know, depending on how you're brought up, what was your family life? Were you in a state of scarcity a lot? Were you in a state of, you know, kill or be killed any of it? You know, um, do you have a, a, a spiritual practice? All the things like shape how we think and what turns us on and what gets us lit up, you know? And so um, for me, a lot of things too, I've just always been like, I've, I've always, like, I remember my father, I lived, you know, we lived right outside of Detroit and, um, you know, his name was Fast Eddie. He worked with the mafia a lot and he was a criminal uh, when he was younger. I know he was a criminal and he was, you know, a daddy, but he just covered it up a lot. Um, but, you know, he would come home and use the N word, you know, at the dinner table. And I was just like, and from a very young age, I was just like, you're not allowed to say that dad. And I would just like argue with him. And he was a heavy, heavy drinker, you know? So it was like this 10 year old girl, 12 year old girl arguing with, you know, a 50 year old man who was intoxicated. Um, but it was just this, like, you can't talk that way about people. You know, you, you don't know what these people have been through and they've had a hard life and it's been awful. So it was just always this, like, that's not okay. Like you can't do it. So it's just like a weird thing, you know? So I know how, whatever his trauma was that he was brought up experiencing caused him to have that, that negative feeling towards a, a group of people. And I'm like, you can't do that. Like, that's not okay. You know? And so a lot of times people want to have these like, you know, pure and perfect little bumpers life and everything's nice and safe. And it's just like, you know, as much as I don't love that him and I argued a lot, it turned me into the woman that I am today, you know, because it pushed me even further to be like, mm -mm, fuck that. Like, that's not okay. And people like you, I love you, you know, I want to help you see love in other people, you know? And so it was just this, you know, people shape who you are by, by wanting sometimes, you know, your heart wants to be the opposite, you know, and so it's not, you know, and as a mother, it's just like, oh my gosh, you know, I know my kids are going to have to go in therapy forever to be my kids, you know, because I'm sure I know that I fucked up many, 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 many times, you know, and, but it's just very, uh, it's just humbling, you know, and I just feel like it's, it's important that, Gosh, wouldn't it be nice if we we're all excited? Do you know who Zig Ziglar is? Yes. Yeah, he's an author, right? Or a, Zig, a writer? Z yeah, Zig's passed away long, you know, quite okay. a while ago, but he was one of my first teachers. And Zig, um, 
you know, he was a sales, marketing, motivational speaker, just like, oh, so good. But one of his quotes was like, you know, you'll get everything in life the more you help other people get what they want in life. And, you know, and I remember hearing this quote when they used to have the cassette tapes and I would listen to the cassette tapes in my Walkman and go for a walk and I'd be listening to my Zig. And, uh, and it was just like, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. So just like just one phrase from that man shifted how I viewed what to go do in life, you know, and is this a good choice or is this a selfish choice? Is this a good choice for many, you know, including me? Cause obviously we can't just do for others and not fill up our own buckets. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's really important, you know, to, to honor and have lots lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of teachers you know, and be open to all these perspectives, you know, like I study a lot of different teachers from different religious philosophical points of view, different business points of view, different, you know, you know, intimacy relationships, how to do relationships, how to do health. You know, there's no one right way to do any of these things in our lives. Right. And I think it's radical self-responsibility to be, you know, an automath, like, learn, be a self learner, go out and get excited about, especially now. Oh my gosh. Let's talk about AI. Baby, let's talk about me. me. <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about all the good things and the bad things. <laughs> exactly. the, the amount of just new opportunities coming out with all these new inventions of technology or Super interesting conversation. We'll definitely go there. But I, I love how you're talking about these different influences that came up, whether it be Zig Ziglar or Ecstasy in a Club, two totally different things. Totally like you, different, <laughs> right? You couldn't and... have any more different stimuli. <laughs> but, yeah. you know, everyone had to sort of figure their own way. I, I definitely had an experience with uh, MDMA that was amazing. And I know that the topic of drugs in the Bitcoin world is very controversial because these are obviously, you know, you can make an argument as very fiat to be like damaging your health for like a momentary experience. But for me personally, just like you, uh, I was at the Gorge in Washington, this amazing concert. So good. I know. There? I've been there. Oh, oh my God. It's the best to the see The most show. incredible place you could ever imagine. Just like a huge, just, it's like a one of those puzzles that you used to see at your grandma's house, like the thousand piece, just amazing nature view. Yeah. And like you said, I, I, as, as it's hitting you and you're just connecting with this music on a deep level and I'm just surrounded by people that I love. And it's just like, it, it, it changes the way that you look at a lot of things and yeah, everyone has a different sort of brain. And of course, and unfortunately people have to be like careful with drugs now, even more than ever, because there's like bad stuff mixed into it. So you have to be super careful, super I careful, have a, one of the friends that way back I used to, you know, go out to these things with died from it. So you have to be super freaking careful with that stuff. Unfortunately, it sucks. But the it, you have to know if you have addictive tendencies, I think, because of course. if you if you're the type of person that can feel this feeling and you want more of it, it can get the slope will get very slippery very fast. But for yep. me, I don't really have that. I, I did that one experience that summer what was it like 2014 or 15 or something? And I just, I swear I became permanently happier from this one day <laughs> or it's one weekend. True. It was a day. Or, it, it is. I mean, and, and, yeah. and I agree with you. I think, you know, any substance, there's a slippery slope, right? And if you look at it, you know, and I went down many substance paths with alcohol. I went down partying a lot. Obviously I was a DJ. People are always like, sure, have some drugs, have some mushrooms, have some ecstasy, have some Coke, have some everything. And I'm just like, okay, um, you know, let's party. And so it was definitely a toxic lifestyle, you know, as a DJ and traveling everywhere. Um, and thank God back in the day, like we didn't have all the fentanyl nonsense, you know, and I'm so, so, so sorry about your friend. I know my nephew overdosed accidentally because of something and it was fentanyl laced. Uh, I have another friend whose son accidentally overdosed because of the fentanyl um, laced. And so, you know, as a mom, that's scary to think about like, you know, the kids going out there and I'm like, okay, here's a test strip. I don't want you doing drugs, of course, but I'm not, I want you to have Narcan on you and I want you to have test strips because it just in case, 
you know, you decide you're going to make a choice and I'm not there and I'm not going to, you're going to, you know, these kids are getting older. They're going to make their own choices. So it's like, at least have that. So it's not condoning. It's like you get car insurance because you hope you're not going to get in a crash. It doesn't mean you're out there trying to drive like a dumbass, you know? And so as a mom, it's been a difficult thing to like, oh, do I just say don't do it? That's, that's irresponsible. Like I think as yeah. a parent, you know, and so trying to be completely prohibitive about these things is just too heavy handed and it's going to backfire. It just, it does. It backfires. And we all know, like when you're a teenager, if you tell somebody not to do something, they're like, cool, Pandora's box. I'm doing it. Screw you, mom. Um, it's just normal. I, we were all that way, but I agree with you. I think, you know, when you, you look at consciousness expansion, you look at heart expansion, you know, you look at shifting the way that you look at the world. There's many, many ways to do it. You can go sit and meditate in uh, a temple for six years all by yourself and then get different realizations and different epiphanies. You can do ayahuasca. You can do any of the stuff, right? You can do breath work, you know, deep, deep breath work. Um, and so uh, it's, there's lots of ways to shift. But when you start getting that addiction of like, oh, I just want it, I want it, I want it versus like this was a stepping stone in your, it's your a tool. evolution, it's in a your tool. consciousness, mm -hmm. you know, journey, you know, those are two different kind of things. And so I think it's important, you know, anytime when something becomes a habit, then, you know, like with an external substance, it's like, hmm, is it, you know, having too much control over me? You know, and I was, you know, I had an issue with alcohol years ago and uh, ended up going to rehab, almost died. It was a total nightmare, you know, because I got into this, this funk, you know, and midlife crisis and all sorts of stuff, you know, like all these big stressors were happening in my life all at the same time. And so big move, hormonal stuff, stuff going on with our company, stuff going on with my ex, everything. My you know, stepmom had Alzheimer's. So it was like layer, 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 layer. And I wasn't taking care of myself. I was just numbing out because it was the quickest, easiest way to deal. And then it was like, oh, okay. Now the kids are at school. Okay. I guess I'll have some wine at lunch and you know, what's uh, I don't have to pick them up for four hours. It's cool. So it just, it was that slippery slope and it was like, no, what are you doing? And so it's very, very important to have that, that self-awareness and able to regulate. And if you see yourself not doing something and you think you have to go hide or any of it, it's like, that's kind of the time when you need to raise your hand and say those three words that most humans never want to say. Do you know what those three words are, Ben? What are they? I need help. Hmm. Yep. It's so hard. If you're a badass, if you're somebody who's running a house, running a company, if you're a creator, if you're anybody in the world who considers yourself pretty awesome, which hopefully most of us do, when things start to fall apart bit by bit, you think this is just temporary. I'll get myself out of it. If you're a healer, if you're a caregiver, you think like, this can't happen to me. I'm going to pull myself out. Don't worry. And so our ego gets in the way until it's too late, you know, until you've gotten to a point where you have a full blown issue, you know, and then all these things compound again, it's a systemic issue. Your relationships fall apart. Your body starts falling apart. You're not thinking clearly. You're not sleeping well. Your hormones are messed up. You know, you're not eating as well. All the things that contribute to you not making great decisions compound, compound, compound. And then you're like, oh, now I need a little bit more of that substance, whether it's weed, whether it's alcohol, whether it's sex, whether it's porn, whether it's shopping, whether it's food, whether it's working out. Like when you're trying to fill up this soul hole with all these external things, you know, it's very, very dangerous. I created this project called the 11X Love Method, and it's about designing your code. It's about having daily practice and making sure that life all of these 11 areas of life don't fall through the cracks and that you're in harmony throughout the year. Again, you're going to have ups and downs in certain areas, but making sure that you're not leaving any of the boxes unchecked as you go through life. And then all of a sudden you tip over, which is what happened to me. So I created this, this framework and this process because I needed it. Now I'm like, how can I share it with other folks? You know? And so I'm working on putting this into an app. I'm working on AI with the app, of course, and Bitcoin, because we want to zap each other in socials and, and um, how to do accountability and have fun this way. But, you know, I, I think a lot of people 
think they know themselves really well. We all think that, but do you really, and do you really know like each other and have you taken time to really dive deep and write it down, you know, and understand what are your beliefs? What are your values? What's your mission? What are your obstacles? What are, do you, you know, a lot of people talk about making a vision board, which I do. I love it. Have you ever made a fear board? Tim Ferriss talks about making a fear board, you know, like what are the things that you're most afraid of? Are they really, you know, holding you back? Do you have a trauma board? Do you know what traumas are holding you back in life? Like, I didn't know this, but uh, until I was in rehab, you know, eight years ago, uh, that I was molested by my uncle as a little girl. Cause my brain just was like, nope, shut that shit down. We didn't happen. No, 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 no. And so our brains, when trauma happens, have the ability to protect us, especially as very young children. Um, and we can, it can compartmentalize things and then you can just put it in here trip, and then get on with your life. And so people who've experienced trauma, um, have a tendency to have more addictive patterns and have, you know, emotional, you know, things going on in life. And if you don't know that, and then all of a sudden all this stuff's happening in your life, you're just like, fuck, you know, and then it's like taking a giant thorn out of your foot. All of a sudden you're like, whoa, that feels so much better. And I don't have to hold on to this. And so knowing, taking time to get to know yourself, doing hypnotherapy, doing EMDR, doing trauma work, somatic work. I can't speak highly enough about it. And it's just like every single human, if you were born, you have trauma. Just the birth process alone. It doesn't matter if you're a C-section or you came out of your mother's, you know, lady parts, you have trauma. That's a traumatic experience going from the womb and then a whole new thing. Like your nervous system's like, holy shit, what just happened, you know? And so just that one experience alone is trauma. And so I think, you know, this project, I, you know, I always tell people it's like getting your MEHD, you know, it's really getting to know yourself and then really mapping out, like, what do I want to bring forward? What do I want to let go of and give gratitude to, you know, that were my teachers. And then how do I want to design this next chapter of life, wherever you may be. And it's very, very good when people are in a huge transition, it's a good process to go through, you know, but then a lot of times people put this, this, you know, this code, this board, any of it, they stick it in the corner, they put it up and they're like, yeah, that's great. And they don't do anything. It's like making a business plan, sticking it in the drawer. And then just each day, like, okay, what's the fire that I have to put out today? That's not how you run a company, the successful, profitable one anyway, you know, and that's not how you run your life. And so when you do that with your team, create a team of trusted people and you share codes and you share your mission, vision, values, you share your OKRs and your, you know, your dreams, then you can help hold each other to the highest standard with permission, of course, and with skills and how you talk to each other. And so, so that's this project that I'm working on called the 11 X love method. Yay. That's uh, amazing. Is it, will, will it be out in the near future? So I can put it in a show notes or I guess people can just follow you and follow for updates. Yeah. Just go, go to DJ Valerie, uh, com forward slash subscribe. And I'm going to be putting things on the mailing list because, um, I just did some workshops a couple of weeks ago. The idea is I want to create something kind of like a Yoda in your pocket, you know, so using AI, obviously that gets to know you with all of these things, right? What are your big wishes? What's your kryptonite? You know, what are things that are going to trigger you and throw you off course in life, which we all have, um, all of it. So sensitive information, right? Um, and, but then having the social layer where you can have your accountability little buddies in these little pods, and then we'll have group coaching. You can have one-on-one -on -one stuff to help and support people. But, you know, it's like, let's have some fun challenges and games. Like you don't learn by reading a book. You don't, you don't learn by watching a video. You learn by doing the thing. And so how can we gamify and use gamification techniques? Um, one of my teachers is Yukai Cho, and he has this thing called the Actalysis Prime Framework. And there's eight drivers that he uses. He's a behavioral scientist and works with Google and all these companies. Um, but it's like, how do you use game uh, gamification pass uh, points and leaderboards and badges? So it's really, again, what are your drivers? What are your key drivers as an individual? So Ben, for you, you might be like, oh, I love getting points. I'm going to play the game because I want to have 10 million billion. I'm a total gamer. I love points. Give me all right. points from anything. Give it to right. me. Like, cool. Ooh, scoop <laughs> it up. Scoop. I can do this. I'll trade you this. Give me the points. Right. Whereas me, I might be like, I don't care about points. I want to go to the next level. I want to go to the expert level or I want to go to the golden level, whatever, you know, so I'm more interested in levels than points. Another person might be like, oh, 
I don't care about any of that. I just don't want to lose where I'm at. So I want to have a streak. Don't lose the streak. And so all these different ways that you can create user experiences that keep the, the, the community in a fun, engaged, sticky experience. And so how do we integrate something like that in with personal development and then having Bitcoin, right? So it's like, how fun would it be when you're having challenges or you're doing your games that it's like, cool, Ben reached the milestones. I'm going to zap him some sats. You know what I mean? And so that's super duper important to have fun and, you know, or, oh, I didn't check in today. I'm going to lose some sats or I'm going to have to make a donation to some crappy charity and I have to make a social media post about it. You know, so there's all sorts of ways to hack yourself into positive behavior change that you choose, you know, and so integrating more complex ways that gamification is used is very important. And then AI having that Yoda in your pocket you know, is super cool. So we've seen, you know, the explosion of all of, you know, AI and I'm, you know, I know this much about it, right? Um, Cause it keeps changing every day, <laughs> but like, how cool will it be to have a trusted little Yoda in your pocket to remind you, hey Val, it, you know, do those 10 push-ups on your break or whatever it is that you said you want to do, like let the AI be your buddy or it's kind of like, hey, Oh, it's the full moon. You know, your lady cycle's coming up. I think you need to go get some chocolate, um, you know, or <laughs> whatever. <laughs> or steak. I do steak. Steak and red and dark, dark chocolate and steak. Um, <laughs> but like, you know, and that's going to be cool, but you don't want to just have the AIs being the only source of, of your engagement. So that's where the social group comes in and having real humans, you know, and you can mix and match your little tribes each month, each quarter, each year, however you want to do it. But really thinking like, how do you keep variety in there? How do you have some level of consistency? Um, you know, and so it's very, very cool to think about like, how can we pull all of these things with Bitcoin, with personal, with professional development, using AI, using social dynamics to create something that is a lifestyle. You know, it's not just, oh, I did a workshop or, oh, I just did this one, you know, course or this weekend thing. It's like, how do you do this rinse and repeat each year and make it something that you do with your family, make it something you do with your teams at a company, make it doing something that you do with your friends. Like Strava app is huge. They've got all these wonderful people who are like, cool, let's go mountain biking today. I'm going to climb this. And so it's fun, you know, because you get to do it together and it's experiential. You know, when I was in, I did the 12 step program uh, after I got out of rehab and of course I did all this other stuff, Kundalini yoga teacher training and all my business stuff, all my nerdy stuff. I'm like, ah, how do I reinvent myself after this whole giant colossal collapse? You know, um, tons of shame, you know, I felt like, oh my God, I'm such a loser. You know, how could this happen to me? Um, but I realized being in rehab, I call it mehab, and uh, and <laughs> it's not that I want everyone to go through the shame part of mehab, but like working with me, you get to go to mehab because it's about focusing on you and not worrying about everybody else and people pleasing and all the stuff that a lot of us, you know, entrepreneurs and healers and creatives do. Um, but the shame around it was really, really giant. Like nobody sends you flowers and cards in rehab. If you break your leg in the hospital, you're going to have a room full of cards and flowers. But if you have a mental health collapse, nobody's taking care of you the same way. And I thought, gosh, that's really unfortunate, you know, and it really hurts. And people are scared. They don't know. Like, am I supposed to talk, call you or visit you or how does it work? You know? And so it's like this stupid thing. And I'm like, it's, a hospital, literally, you know, and you're learning about things of how you work up here. They teach you all this other stuff, like eat carbohydrates and protein, but they don't teach you like how to have skills, not pills up upstairs. And so, um, so I just thought that was really sad, you know, and I think about so many people who are suffering, feeling like awful. And I'm like, well, of course you collapse. You didn't have the skill set and the support system, you know, and the tools to figure out how to get yourself so that you don't get to this collapsing point, you know, and you used all these different external substances. And so it was just shocking to me. I met billionaires. I met kids. I met teachers. I mean, kids like teenagers, you know, I met a nurse. I met psychologists. I'm like, how can a psychologist be in here? You're supposed to be the one helping everybody, you know? And like, Nobody was immune. There's a hairdresser. There's a the construction guy. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is affecting everybody. You know, nobody's immune from this. And so 
when I did the 12 step program, the best part about it was it was consistent no matter where I was in the country or the world, you can expect, you know, cool, here's some steps. Great. We all speak the same language. Cool. We're all here to, you know, not use alcohol or not have sex with 10 million people or do porn or eat too much or overspend. Like there's all these little subcategories of 12 steps. But the problem that I saw, the two things, again, the decentralized thing, great system, great. I love the sponsor sponsee thing. That was awesome. Cause like you got somebody who would like help you and try to, you know, be your buddy, but it wasn't reciprocal. And I love that. And here's why most of us want to reciprocate when we're doing like accountability and then it always leads to imbalance. So I'm like, why not just start with the imbalance, which is just, you're the giver and I'm the receiver. And then I'm going to be someone else's giver and they'll be the receiver and they're someone else's giver and so on and so on. So you always know your role. And so you don't ever have to feel badly about like, oh, I, I you know, like if you're trying to do 69 or do t- double massages with your boyfriend or girlfriend, you're like, I don't really want to give you a massage. I just got one and I'm tired. You know, <laughs> it's like you just want to chill. But a lot of times you're like, well, you gave me a massage and I got to give you one. Um, so it's just sort of like. Sometimes it's okay to just be in the role of receiver, but, but here's the issue that I take with the 12 step program. And I wish they could figure this out because it's such a great program. Um, other than this is at the beginning of every meeting, you're supposed to say, hi, I'm Val. I'm a sex addict. I'm an alcoholic. I'm a drug addict. I'm a, a food addict. I'm a shopper addict, you know, whatever. Um, and then you get to have that label for your whole life, your whole life. And I'm just like, but I don't want that. Like I'm somebody who's evolving and growing and constantly moving. I don't want to be labeled as a label, you know? And, and so I constantly resisted that part and I'm like, I'll do the work. These steps are good and I'll go do the thing, but I, I'm not going to call myself a name because guess what happens when you call yourself a name? You become the name. Yeah. It's you a know? self-fulfilling prophecy. Exactly. And there's studies done when there's in, in, when people who are being released from prison, if they're called ex-cons or criminals, they're more likely to have repeat behavior unless in, if they are called that name versus, hey, Bob. Really? Interesting. Yeah. And so, oh. you know, and so studying Tony Robbins helped me understand this too. And this was before I got that stat on the, the, uh, the criminals, you know, um, like the repeat behavior when you identify as that um, Tony Robbins, I remember him saying this, and this is when I stopped going to the meetings after like two years, he was like the person's a human's need to be consistent with their identity. It's one of the most important things that we have. So if you identify as a criminal, if you identify as a loser, if you identify as a, a whore, if you identify as an addict, you have identified any of it. If that's what you say you are, then you're gonna, your subconscious will live up to that, you know? Even if it's in a negative sense, like ex-con or ex-criminal, like that's still attached to you. It's still, it's like Mm -hmm. I'm an ex-alcoholic or an ex-wife abuser or something. It's just like, no, I am love. That's it. I am love. I am a child of God, a child of the universe, a child of the infinite. And so that's your identity. And when you identify as these these other things, again, like your ego will be like, okay, even though your heart's just like, oh, I don't like that, you know? And so I think it it's it's so soul crushing to to do that and to say yes to that, you know? And I'm listening to a book, I think maybe it was in the Peacekeepers book where the stat was, but there's it's called, you know, peacekeeping and it's about, you know. How do you have differences of opinions, especially in right now with the what we're seeing with all the politics and all the nonsense going on and the div- division, you know, um, it's like everyone's going to have opposite points of view at some times. It doesn't mean you're going to break up a relationship with someone just because they don't agree with your point of view on stuff. So I think right now it's so important that people stay connected with each other through our hearts, through the lens of love and not the lens of opposition and this tribe versus that tribe and this team and this side, it's like, it's all just a scam. It's a fiat minded scam to keep us exhausted on the little hamster wheel so they can control us. So fuck it's off. It's intentional. Like yeah. you said, it, <laughs> like this is intentionally pushed down and it goes all the way down to like the family unit and, you mm-hmm. know, really trying to get even kids sucked into this where they hate their parents or they don't trust their parents. You totally. know, when you, 
I mean, you hear these stories about the things that schools, like the government schools are now giving the children. It's really trying to just undercut the parents in mm -hmm. a way, yeah. you know, and, and replace them with the state. And then yep. you have much more. And then they're, they're, you're in a palm of their hand of becoming one of these, as you said, politics, red team versus blue team is a perfect example. You know, they're just angry at each other. They're not actually angry at the people who are causing the real problems. Yeah. And I, I think the thing with a lot of people, you know, they're, you think about the conditioning that sports has on people's minds, you know, especially men, um, go Broncos, go whatever Cowboys go this, you know, and people Seahawks. go Seahawks, go Seahawks, you know? And so it's cool and fun to play sports and have games. But the minute you start to get that, that if you're having a bad day, cause your team lost, you know, and you start taking it out on your friends or your family, or you're just like, mm, it's kind of like, maybe you're taking the game a little too seriously. You know, it's just a game with a ball and some dudes. That's it. I guys. literally know people that are like that. Like this oh, is totally. It'll such ruin... a huge part of their life. Yeah. And so they identify as the team thing. And then the opposite is oh, there we're against. So it's this for and against mentality. And so I think the way that the brain gets developed, and again, I'm not a neuroscientist, but I would imagine there are some pathways that are there that get you learning how to think oppositionally as a regular way of thinking us versus them winning. If, if I win, it must mean you lose. So it's that zero sum game mindset again, you know? And so that applies in business that applies in love that applies in family. And so I think that that conditioning, like you said, is by design, you know, and what do they say? Give, give them bread and circuses, you know, keep the, the masses busy so we can go extract all the value from these people who aren't paying attention, you know? And so it's very, very important that people pay attention, you know, because you're getting manipulated. And I think the young people, I have no idea what it must be like being a young person today with a phone in your hand and the way that their brains are developing, you know, from a very young age with the bombardment of messaging, you know, and that's why I think like the AI is so powerful, but it's got to be ultra ethical. It's got to be ultra safe and secure. Any of your data that you're putting in, especially if you're doing this, you know, let's say this 11X thing, or we're making, you know, uh, you know, the, the app I want to build, I want to build something called Edster, you know, like an educational thing. And so then the 11X program would be one of millions that would hopefully get used here. So we would use Noster. We would have something that's similar to like a circle uh, dot SO app, you know, and then having the game stuff in it and, and whatnot. But then, you know, like right now we're looking at about a $240 billion a year market cap for online education, you know, and, and when you add in like the AI and gamification, like the CAGR is about 24%. So by 2030, you're looking at a trillion dollar market. Do you know how many people can get orange pilled just in that market? If we give them this little Edster app, you know what I mean? And so it's like, cool, you can have Yoda in your pocket with gaming and with all the bells and whistles of all the stuff. And you can do your project in it and the way that you teach. And okay, cool. You do your thing with your business training and whatnot. So, so I really want to hope to disrupt that, that market in a very, very cool, big way, but um, ethically, you know, and helping people learn. But it's again, how do you have these kids? How the heck are they going to grow and learn and, and, be discerning. Like they're not discerning enough to know that they're being manipulated. Adults are not, you know, people who've had their brains formed past 25 for decades still buy into the nonsense. And then they still get that division and that toxicity, you know? And it's just like, you guys, it's all just a puppet show. It's all just a fucking puppet show. It's not like, these are people who are puppets too, who you think you're all excited about. They're being strung along by the cracking. You know? yeah. It's crazy. So uh, and, yeah, and I can obviously go on about this a lot. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And I just find it so interesting when you look at the generation differences. They're, each generation really sort of fits a mold in general. Are, are you millennial or Gen X? You're probably close, right? I'm a Gen X. Yeah. You're Gen X. So I'm millennial. You're Gen X. You know, when you look at from boomer to Gen X to millennial to Gen Z, it's very interesting to look at these patterns. I'm sure you, you are fascinated by this as well. 
whereas the boomers and this is just my general view i could be wrong i'm curious what you think the baby boomers are just so brainwashed <laughs> they they were completely yeah uh they were raised in the 1971 fiat era where the they got a lot of things much easier um they the money printer was their friend basically they they threw a dart at a dartboard for pretty much any stock or mutual funds and that went way up and they bought a house for as uh james lavish said on the podcast uh two acorns and a walnut <laughs> <laughs> And they, they picked it up for dirt cheap and it's worth way more now. So they're feeling good. And then you have the Gen X after that. You guys had less of these free benefits. And so you, you sort of, you're sort of in the middle ground between the, what is kind of funny. It's like, you guys were like skipped over sort of, there's this millennial versus boomer clash going on because the millennials mm. are growing up right now saying like, what the fuck? Like, it's like I can't even afford to feed myself, and these boomers are like lecturing me about like pulling myself up by my bootstraps. You need you to work me? harder. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. When when they had so many like extremely significant boosters that helped them just get much, much more, much easier. And yeah. not only that, but they were conditioned by the news to say that oh, see, you you worked very hard. You did so good. This is all you. You did amazing. And so they were groomed to believe that it was all you know their personal doing and so now when the millennials have these issues they think it's their fault and they 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 don't understand the economics of it i think you know obviously some people are starting to wake up we do have thank goodness we've got gary and we've got greg and some of our boomer buds you know i'm i'm cusp of boomer gen x actually so (laughs) that's i'm right there but what I think people don't get is there is a different work ethic, you know, that a lot of these folks had and the way that their money could get stretched was very different. You know, you could go buy a house for $25,000. You could go put yourself to school for $7,000 a year for college. I paid for my whole college education with no debt. I bartended my way through college. Um, I was the first and only person who'd gone to college in my family ever. And uh, they all thought like, oh, you're going to be pregnant by the time you're 18. Why are you going to college? And I'm like, fuck you. I'm not going to be like you guys. I love you, but bye bye. And, uh, but it was one of those things. It was like, it was affordable. I made enough money where I could buy the tuition. I could put a roof over my head, $200 a month rental for a a, a room rental in a house, you know? So it's like, it's literally 10 X that today, 10 X, but the salaries and the earnings capacity, like of a bartender is not 10 X, you know, or of a waitress or any of those jobs. And so it's just like, you're still working those 40 hours a week or 30 hours a week if you're not full time, but it's like, your purchasing power is completely diminished. And so of course you're going to be like, what the heck? I can't get what I need here as a young person. It's a ripoff, you know? And obviously again, us old farts didn't know that this money printer thing was causing such a big problem, you know, because we're like, cool, great, awesome, cheap interest. Great. Do this, all the stuff that we did, you know, that messed everything up. Now it's like, Oh God, we got to go fix it. Um, but I, it, it is, it's a, it's an unfair inheritance that your generation and then the younger generation below you that my kid's age is inheriting. Um, and it's like, how do we get ourselves out of this so that we're not leaving this, this toxic inheritance to our, you know, generation after generation after generation. And so obviously Bitcoin is the only thing I've seen so far. If there's something better, show me. But have you seen anything better than Bitcoin to help get us out of this mess, Ben? Nostra is second place, maybe. They're close. Cool. Those two things are both amazing. <laughs> Nostra is insane. Tell, like, I know your audience probably knows what Nostra is, but, you know, Nostra is something that I'm so, like, excited about and just decentralized social communications and obviously being able to send some tips and value for value to people if you want to. But I like the idea, like, free and open speech is paramount to freedom. If you can't express yourself and if you have to constantly self-censor yourself because you're afraid of your government, you're afraid of your church, you're afraid of your business, you're afraid of something. Big tech like, platform cutting you off and destroying your account. <laughs> totally. destroy Or destroying your business. If your business is on a, a platform, like Simply obviously got deplatformed from YouTube a couple, like a month or two ago. And it was like, huh? And so it's not okay that these technical places have the ability to just push a switch and just be like, 
okay, you're, you don't get to have a voice anymore. That's so dangerous, you know, and then what's even more dangerous is these politicians, any of them, we need to censor and have no disinformation and misinformation and blah, 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 blah. And it's just like, we don't want hate speech on there. We'll define hate speech. Who gets to define what hate speech is? If I say that a man is a man and a woman is a woman, is that hate speech? Not to me, but according to someone else, that might be hate speech. And so I'm going to get canceled or shut up, you know? And it's just like, that's crazy, you know, to be like, oh, I'm not allowed to say something. I better just play along with the game because I don't want to get canceled. That's not how you have a free and open society. That's how you have an authoritarian regime. And I think, you know, young people need to wake up and get on Noster and pay attention. Like everybody needs to be using Noster or any other decentralized, uncensorable platforms as a backup, you know, and, but then build the new system and let the other one crumble. I, I just, that's what we've got to do. Like what Bucky Fuller says. And so it's, it's so, so important, you know? Um, but you're right. Yeah. I think Noster is like, psh, dudes in Noster, I swear, like all the devs, I'm like, you guys are fucking amazing, like working so hard, doing all this stuff so that everybody can have free speech. I'm just so blown away by the genius and the generosity of people's time, you know, and, and their, their ability to build these things, you know, and it's like, here, check it out. How oh, do you like my thing? I'm like, oh my God, this is awesome. Often for free too. A lot of them aren't getting paid or only yeah. the, they're only getting zaps like the rest of us, you know? Yeah. And, and it's insane. And I, I mean, just trying to imagine the code that goes into all this stuff and the time to make it happen. I, it's like, it's not like you're making a blog post, you know, like, <laughs> you know, you're making a whole thing. I just, it's, I've never experienced this in any other community, not in a business community, not in the music community, not in the health and wellness community, uh, you know, not in the art community. Like Bitcoiners are so remarkable. Like they're just, they're the most remarkable people I've ever met in my life. Like Same. hands down. Absolutely. Hands down. It's just like, holy moly, from all angles, creativity, business savvy, you know, technical savvy, soul savvy, you know, and it's just like, it is, it's a, it's a very, very generous group of people. And, and I love to see the generosity spreading and I love to see the community growing, you know, and more people kind of getting that little light that turns on their soul, you know, that it's just I don't know. Bitcoin is hope in action. That's what I always say. And more you know? people are able to find that that bright light when you can give the, help them, or I guess when they can themselves find in whatever way they can that yeah. extra bandwidth in their mind and their soul, like you said. Because most people right now are really just crushed. They're so by crushed. The fiat world and all of its madness. It's it's like. It, it's so hard to pay rent and to even buy healthy food and oh like what even is healthy food we've been fed so much bullshit on that too like i don't know what yeah. to eat um you know relationships are now degrading quickly like all around it and i'm sure you're a people watcher i'm a total people watcher i see so many couples out there that are not happy yeah. they're they're sort of just doing going through the motions because they think they're supposed to and there just isn't that healthy polarity anymore because like you talked about like what's a woman <laughs> All of a sudden, the questions about the most basic things are being pushed down from the top to cause even more confusion. And this is absolutely part of the plan to just keep people unaware of anything. They, they, have, they have no brain space left to think about any, like, how, how are we supposed to come back to this Renaissance era of building beautiful buildings and creating right. beautiful art and all, you know, loving each other when we don't even know, you know, what a man and a woman is? Like that is crazy, you know? It is. I agree. It is super insane. I did an our episode with Svetsky a couple months ago and, uh, you know, he had said a couple of things on there that of course I did not agree with, but I love him. He's my friend. And I like, again, just like with my father, not that, you know, it's like, I like having conversations that don't involve the same thing all the time. We're not here to mentally masturbate and just, oh, yay us. We all, you know, it's like, no. Let's push back on each other a little bit as humans and check the sanity and common sense level of things, you know, and the love level. Is this loving? Is this going to promote a better world? Or is this something that's like, you know, unsafe? 
for people? Is this something that, you know, harms uh, a majority over a minority? Like, how do you regulate these things, you know, as far as just sanity goes? And I, I just, it, it was really, it was scary. Like I brought up the thing, it was during the Olympics. It was when the, there was the guys boxing the women. I'm like, okay, guys, no, I'm not going to shut up about this right now. This seems unfair. Like the, these women are getting in the ring thinking they're going to fight another woman. And then all of a sudden it's somebody who was born differently than they were with their chromosomes. And I'm just like, that's not, that's cheating. In the old days, that would be abuse and that would be cheating. But now that you want to identify, because you are allowed to say that, I'm supposed to just shut up and say that this is okay, or that there's somebody with a penis in the girl's locker room and my daughter has to go look at that. And I'm supposed to just say, oh, well, it's okay. No, it's not okay. It's not safe and it's not fair. And so it's like, we have separate ability, you know, um, experiences for people. So it's like, if this is something that people wish to have, um, you know, identify as whatever you wish, let's create a safe space for you. Let's make sure that you're safe. Let's make sure that if you want to participate in sports, that you have a safe place to do so with other folks who are compatible with you physiologically, you know, and then there you go. Um, we want everybody to be safe and included, not just a few of us and a couple of us at the expense of others. That's not fair. But so to me, it's like, we have solutions. We can build things. We can create separate categories so that everybody gets to participate. You know, it's not about exclusion and it, but it's like, let's be reasonable and fair, but it's like, oh my God, I got so much hate when I started saying you're spreading hate. I'm like, no, this isn't, there's nothing hateful about this. There's zero ounces of hate in what I'm saying. Okay. It'd be one thing if I said, screw you, that's not very nice. Like I, that would be uncool, but I'm like, let's figure a solution out that involves you getting to participate in a fair and safe way. Person who wants to be different, you know, like I can't imagine what it's like being different like that. You know what I mean? I don't know what it must feel like. And so let's figure out how to have compassion and love for people who, who are different, you know, but it doesn't mean you pull this whole group of people down. That's unfair. Like the girl who got paralyzed because of the volleyball player hitting her, that was a, a man, you know, but they identified as a woman. And so it was like, that's not safe guys. Like that's silly. And so fearing that you're going to get canceled or attacked because of that is, is not how we want to build a free and open society and allowing centralized powers to say, oh, we're going to decide what's fair and what's no, like the reason why we have the first amendment isn't because like RFK said, it's not because of all the speech that we like. And it's not because the stuff that we all agree on. It's because of the stuff that we disagree on. And it's because of the stuff that someone else says that you don't agree with. That's why we have the first amendment, you know? And so it's like, that's what people have to understand. The more that we're all like, everyone gets a cookie and we're all equal and we can't be like, that's, socialistic crap. And so that's not the society we want to have here at all. Um, and I want young people to pay attention to that because the more they do this, you know, everyone gets a cookie thing. I'm like, are you the ones who are going to go to the, the war? Like when we're having a, a, a draft, you want to go to the war? No, you don't. Especially the women who are all, Oh, we want to be fuck that. Like stop voting for stupidity because you're going to go to, you're not going to the war. The men are okay. We're going to tell you the difference between a man and a woman when it comes time to have a, a draft, honey. So men and women are different. We have different skill sets and we have different wonderful things that are great about each other. And so don't try to be a man if you're a woman and don't try to be a woman if you're a man. I mean, obviously if you're in the middle, go be in the middle, but for women who are identifying as women and men identifying as men, we don't need an androgynous society. We need men to be men and women to be women. That's what we were born to do, you know, and the, the small, tiny segment of people who are, you know, over here, great. We love you. Let's figure out how to help you too. But for the most part, women, <laughs> you're a woman, honey, step up and be a woman. Don't try to go be a dude. And the reason I think, and I said this, you know, before Seb Bunny talks about it a lot too, the fiat system has caused this problem. I think 100% is contributing to the toxicity of the male and the female role. And here's why. 
if you're growing up in a society where you don't even feel like, oh, I can go have kids because it's too expensive and I can be the stay at home mom and embrace my femininity and, you know, have play dates and do this stuff. And then my husband can go out and work. Like how on God's green earth can you embrace your femininity if you have to be in the masculine workforce for years and years, decades, you know, before you have enough wealth and your partner has enough wealth where you feel confident to go and have children, you know? And so as those years go by and as women are in the workforce for long, long periods of time, guess what? We become more masculine, you know, we become more like, I got this. I don't need you. Don't tell me what to do versus like, yeah, I want to be feminine and be the housekeeper, not housekeeper, but keeper of the home and, you know, the, the domestic executive, you know, the CEO of your home. And I'm not saying that every woman needs to go have kids. We're not all designed to have children and families. You know, I almost got snipped in my twenties. Cause I was like, ah, oh, I'm fucked up from my childhood. I don't want to mess anybody up <laughs> yet. Yeah, and, but then I met my husband and it was like, okay, maybe I'm missing something. And so it was, you know, cause I was in this, like, I had to spend for myself since I was 18, you know, and it was just like, okay, I don't want to do that. But the fiat system has caused this problem with the masculine and the feminine, you know, and I would, I don't know what it's like for your generation and younger, but it's just kind of like, how the heck are we going to help re reharmonize that, you know, so that the, the people can get back into alignment with men being men and women being women. And I'm not saying that we need to go back and just never work and never contribute to society and never contribute our minds because we've got a whole different way of looking at things. But, you know, it's very, very, I think, important that people look at the, the fiat system and how it's damaging the the social fabric, you know, of, of the masculine and the feminine. Absolutely. And also bringing back the generational conversation, like you said before, there's very pr pretty defined lines between each generation of how these the zeitgeist is in within the men and the women you know yeah. um millennials right now which i am one i i look at the men and the women right now and it's it's really hard to be optimistic about the women of my generation because they've been so so fooled by the feminism you know that yeah they've been told that they need to be a boss babe they need to go work Nothing's more depressing than scrolling through LinkedIn right now because it's just like filled with women who you can just see like they're trying to smile on their profile picture, but they're suffering and they hate what they're doing. And, and they're, you know, now going into their 30s. I'm just about to turn 30. And as we all go into our 30s now, women are learning about this thing called the biological clock. You know, mm -hmm. they 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 don't have the same flexibility as us men do. And And I feel like I am just completely lucky at this point to be a man because you know, just in the last few years, like you, COVID was kind of the wake up for me of getting the Bitcoin and all this stuff and starting to really just shake things up and think maybe I was raised not seeing the real truth. You know, if I was a woman right now about to turn 30, I'd be fucking pissed Yeah, because 30 is a tough year for women. That, that's, a a, tough that's a slap in the face because like which women are taught that 90% of your eggs are gone by 30? None of them. They don't teach that in school, you know? So I didn't know of, that. Ninety percent of your eggs are, are inviolable by the time you're thirty. Yeah, yeah. Wow. It, and then it just continues going down. So there really is like this small window for women's fertility, and you know, there's other things that can be done. Like I, I'm a big fan of the carnivore diet. I keep hearing stories of people, you know, just thinking they're infertile in their like 30s or even 40s, and then they go on this diet and they just all of a sudden have a baby. They're like, oh shit, I didn't know I could do that. So oh, wow. it's like fixing hormones on a really deep level. So we do have tools that can be used. And I am trying to promote those as much as I can for those people. But at the same time, I think that at some point it, we should focus even more of our attention on the younger generations, the Gen Z and Gen Alpha, and make sure that they don't have to go through all these hard lessons that so many of us in these older generations have. Because yeah. we have the knowledge now. We have the technology and the means to get that knowledge to them very quickly and easily. Uh, yeah. We just have to to find those creative ways because that is such a powerful way to just reverse a negative course into a positive one for our species. Because, like you, I mean, I'm I'm thinking big picture. This is what Bitcoin does to us. Is it as soon as your brain starts looking bigger, you start just thinking about the deep future. I want I want you know humanity to be way more awesome in a hundred years, a thousand years. You know, 
Totally. And we, we, we turn that ship around by making sure that the young folks that are coming in to this world can have an amazing start. And that starts with the family. Mm-hmm. And I mean, this is, this is another tough subject. I know you mentioned, like you had some really tough family relationships. And unfortunately, there's so much of that going on right now. And it, it affects men and women, or I guess boys and girls very differently going through that. But in my view, it's even more harmful to women that are really young going through those difficult situations and which are caused by fiat. Like you said, when fiat is creating this financial struggle and the health struggles, all these other struggles for the parents, they aren't able to raise a healthy kid usually. And they have this stress in their relationship and it gets passed down and and the the child just gets filled with this negative energy from a very young age. So what are your thoughts on just how we can fix that problem. I think that's such a core issue. And if we're looking at the future, we need to be fixing these family units, fixing, you know, the way that we teach these young kids. Well, I think, you know, everything always starts with you as an individual, you know, and again, coming back to radical self-responsibility. And so when we all as individuals start to wake up and realize like we're not victims, you know, and it's not the system's fault, Like it's when we get to start realizing like, wow, Bitcoin is a tool. Carnivore diet is a tool. Meditation is a tool. Interpersonal connection and relationships are tools. How well versed am I on using those tools? How well versed am I on self-regulation? How well versed am I on communication? And so um, how well versed am I on myself and my trauma? And that what's happening with me. So whether you're a boomer, an ex, a millennial, any of it, like the minute you start recognizing like everything starts with you, then you can start taking some ownership and shifting your world. And so by doing so, imagine the whole world, Ben, okay, of, 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 of us adults, of, of even teenagers, you know, um, you know, even younger people than teenagers. If we all just understood like, wow. It's, if I just really, really took care and became the best version of myself and I had this set of values that I lived up to, my code, the way that I believe things, and then I actually acted upon that. And then if I saw gaps in my life, I would go figure out like, hmm, I'm really good over here, but I'm kind of sort of not that great here. I'm not suggesting that everyone's going to be an expert in all of these areas of our lives. However, if you're realizing like you're you're missing something in one of these areas, it's important to fill in the gaps with your skill sets. If you're never going to be like somebody who can get skilled at one of those things, which I don't believe any of us are, um, you know, figure out how that's going to impact the rest of your life and look at the consequences, you know? And so I think really starting with yourself is the most important thing that any of us can do. You know, because if we sit and go try to fix the system, but you haven't fixed yourself, fixed meaning, you know, really deep diving and addressing a lot of the healing, um, you're going to resort to all these old coping mechanisms from your past. You know, again, what all this, I call it the five D's, diamonds, drugs, donuts, digital and dicks. And so uh, <laughs> those are those external coping mechanisms that we we had, you know, and so Again, when they get out, some of them are fine in a in, in little bit, but too much is, is out of balance and, or out of harmony and an addiction. And so um, that's to me the number one thing. And then just being aware, it's just kind of like for me, you know, all the things that I went through because I didn't take time to take care of me. And I thought like, oh, I'm the, the best mom in the world. I'm going to put everybody ahead of me. And I didn't take care of my needs and my mission and my dreams and my creativity. Like my life fell apart, you know, because I thought I was doing all these other things that were in service of everyone else, but I completely self-abandoned and I cheated on myself, you know, and I put self-care on the shelf. And unfortunately, when that happened, then nobody else got me. I had to go completely withdrawal and go really, really take care of myself. So instead of having a practice and having consistency, of that self-responsibility and healing and building yourself up, it turned into this explosion, you know, and then it took a lot longer to recover from. So I would say for sure, for younger people, especially um, before, you know, I call it the crisis curve, right? It's like a bell curve, everything leading up to this major crisis, you know, is you can have maintenance things. So you don't ever have to get to that giant peak of a crisis, but really human spirit, because of our ego, we typically don't make big changes in our life until after a crisis, 
you know, whether it's financial, whether it's relationship, whether it's health, those are the three big ones, you know? Um, and cause of our egos, we're like, I got this. I don't want to raise my hand and say, I need help. But the reality is, okay. I don't care if you're Rocky Balboa and you got Apollo Creed and he's punching you and you're on the mat and he's punching you and he's punching you and you have no time or space to get up between those punches. You're staying down on that mat. Okay. Every living organism has a snapping and a breaking point. Okay. It doesn't matter how strong you are, how wealthy you are, how smart you are, what your connections are. Like if you have layer upon layer upon layer upon layer of things and you don't ask for help and you realize like, whoa, <laughs> you need to stop punching me to call the fight, you know, <laughs> like get me off. Like you're going to be screwed. And so humility is one of the most important gifts to give yourself you know, because it's going to, it's a sign of strength, you know, and vulnerability is a sign of strength. And so then you can not have to go through these big giant crisis curves, you know, and then you still have some crisis in life. You're going to have conflict. Nobody's going to get out of that, you know, but does it have to be something that truly explodes your relationships and your whole things that you've been working on? You know, I believe that it doesn't have to be if you practice ahead of time. Like prevention is key. And, and that's what I would say, you know, work on yourself first and it will trickle out into the rest of your life, you know, and that's, yeah. One of my favorite analogies I've heard recently, I think it was a guy, John Laspina brought it to my attention. He's another carnivore YouTube guy. We are not good at keeping the roof repaired when the sun is shining. Exactly. We wait till it rains and then we like, oh shit, we need a roof. <laughs> mm -hmm. Totally. That's exact. That's that kind of beginning of the curve. Right. And so it's like when you're kind of going up, it's like, eh, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. Whatever. Frog in the boiling water, all the great analogies, but um, it's true. And so unfortunately, you know, experience is the greatest teacher. And sometimes we have to have those shit shows before we get that dose of humility, especially young people, because we're invincible when we're in our 20s and our 30s. I can do anything. I'm going to live forever. Nothing's going to get me. Okay. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Wish you the best. Yeah, you got yeah. this. I, I want to have one final topic to really go over here with you. And that is, we, we talked about it a bit earlier in your life and others. But your podcast, you talk to so many awesome people, a lot of them being women, just about how Bitcoin has changed women's life specifically. And I, yeah. I know that you are so good at connecting with women on this level and just helping them understand why they should really care about Bitcoin. Because I feel like most of the information out there around Bitcoin right now is more male focus. It's, it's all about the numbers go up and the blockchain technology and, you know, you're going to get rich and things that kind of speak to, and just like gamification of it all men us men love video games and we love the numbers go up and everything, but there isn't enough info out there on why this is extremely powerful for women as well. So could you give your case for why more of the ladies listening should start getting into Bitcoin and Oster? Totally. Well, and, and again, obviously Bitcoin's for everyone, you know, it's, it's, it's just like air and water. Uh, it, it, we all need it. I, I believe, um, you know, obviously all the people who I've been so privileged to become friends with and interview and support their projects, you know, Natalie and, uh, Krista with access tribe tally with free market kids, uh, excuse me, Rachel with uh, La Femme Orange. I mean, there's so many the amazing women out there trying to help other women learn about Bitcoin from their own lenses, right? Whether it's from the mother lens, whether it's from, you know, a young person's lens, whatever. Um, I, I think for a lot of women, because we're more, you know, it's not about the gamification and all that stuff. It's more about like a lot of us realize like, wow, what do you mean you can get out of a domestic violence situation using Bitcoin? The, who cares? Why don't you just get out? Well, you know, if somebody finds out that you're saving money in a bank account and they find it, like they could kill you, you know, in a domestic violence um, issue. You know, and so I had a guest on and I had to take the episode down because I got a, uh, what is it, a cease and desist letter from the ex husband's attorney. And oh, shit. Mm -hmm. And I asked her before she went on, I was like, are you sure you want to tell your story? You know, cause you've got kids. Oh, it's going to be great. And I made the mistake. I should have anonymized her. That was my, my, 
experience of learning. Um, but he got upset because she told the story about how he was manipulative and controlling and had cameras and knew everything and had ever the money in his name and would only give her cash every week. Didn't even let her have a credit card. And so she was just bit by bit, you know, the frog in the water got to a point where it was like, this is screwed up. Like, you know, but she was in so deep. And so she learned about Bitcoin. Um, and, you know, started having her mom help her save it on a separate cell phone and uh, store her sats, uh, you know, completely privately so that when it was time, because it unfortunately became time with some violence, she was able to escape. And she had a, a little nest egg to start, you know, a safe new life with where he couldn't take it from her, you know, but it, like, if you're in a violent situation, and there's, they find that you're putting cash under the bed to try to escape, like, there's a chance you're going to get beat up and your life could get worse, you know? And so that's one thing for women to understand, not that all domestic violence is, you know, up upon women, but obviously statistics show that it's more, um, obviously, you know, working with families, right? Like how we are all as mothers and people who want to build the future. It's like, are we going to build the world in this toxic soil of fiat? Or do we want to create this beautiful, plentiful, regenerative soil of Bitcoin, right? And so as mothers, you know, I think it's important to think about the money part for the future and not just, oh, the men will go do that. No, it doesn't. Again, it doesn't mean you need to go be a crazy executive all the time, but you need to know about the money in your home and how this works for your family, you know, and have those conversations. Uh it just, it's so important to have financial literacy around life. And I think as a woman and as, uh, certainly as a mother, it's a lot of times like, oh, it's a man's thing. So that's where I will say that women need to participate with our brains and understand like this, you know, how are we going to grow for the future and how are we going to save and how are we the domestic executives if we choose to be, you know, uh, moms or stay at home's moms, you know, and, and if you don't, if you're not somebody who wants to have kids, cool, no big deal, but like you need to be ultra super executive of your financial world, you know, and if you're constantly thinking like, I'm just going to build my whole life in this fiat world. Like you're going to possibly constantly be like, okay, I've got just enough water, air to breathe. And you know, you're going to be in this inflation hell. And so learning about, you know, financial sovereignty using Bitcoin as one of the tools is, is, it's not just a survival mechanism. It's a thriving mechanism for you to get your dreams, uh, you know, accomplished in the world. So I think money is not scary. It's amazing. Um, you know, and, and it, when it's sound money, it's conscious money, it's love money, it's freedom money. It's like so much better, you know, because then you start to realize, wow, look at the people around me are thriving. Look, there's a communities popping up, these little circular economies. And look, I can send somebody Bitcoin overseas for pennies on the lightning network, you know, and I can transact and it opens up opportunities for fair trade and all of the things that like women love, you know? And so it's like, why not get more, t dip your toes in little bit by bit, you know, and we're all here to help. You know, we all started at, at clueless and now we're a little bit less than clueless, <laughs> you know? So everybody starts at zero with their Bitcoin knowledge. And so there's no, um, uh, there's, it's, no one's ever too late to learn Bitcoin. And we all start at zero, like every one of us. So don't be afraid to ask for help with any of us. Like all of us Bitcoiners are, you know, so excited when someone's like, Hey, will you show me how to do this or that? Or what does this mean? And it's like, if we don't know the answers, <laughs> there's a plethora of people who do. And so <laughs> that's what ask Noster cool. will know. If you do hashtag Nos ask Noster, pretty much everyone on there right now is like, at least, well, it is actually, thankfully, diversifying. It's becoming more and more non-Bitcoiners, but still heavily cool. Bitcoiners. So they'll be able to answer your questions. <laughs> totally, yeah. And like, yeah, and get an Oster account and like learn about Noster, learn those two things. If those are two things that you can do in the next, you know, period of time when you're listening to this, like you're going to be one step further on the path, you know, of of conscious and financial sovereignty and freedom. And it's it's important and building a new world. Like most people would agree that what we have in front of us right now is unsustainable. It's painful. You know, we're funding, you know, the other thing is for funding forever wars. People don't understand, you know, um, 
I don't know where I just read, it, it was probably on Twitter, but just some statistic about how many wars the U.S. has been in over the last, you know, 100 years and the last, since we went off the, the gold standard and we've been able to just print, print, print. We've had like, you know, exponential growth on how many, you know, wars we've been involved in or, you know, military conflicts they're calling them now. <laughs> um, and so what people don't get is when you have access to a money printer that's infinite and not a limited supply like Bitcoin, you can just be like, you're a dictator. You need a billion dollars. You need some trillions. Oh, cool. Go, go kill this population with these children. And it's just so easy because you're like printing monopoly money from some sheets of paper that you got out of your printer. That's literally what they're doing. And then they go buy guns and bombs with it and they kill kids. So if you're a woman and you don't want kids and innocent people to get killed, learn about Bitcoin. Freedom go up, love go up, peace go up. Like you said earlier, it's Let's amazing. Do it. That's what yeah. sound money does. And it's, there are so many different avenues to explore there. One even less intense one is just the fact that, you know, I, I've found from my experience that women are just much better at connecting with humans and understanding the human condition. And you yeah. find so many interesting humans in Bitcoin and Oster. Like that is where the characters are right now. <laughs> so you will just have a field day just finding all these cool people doing cool things. And you'll have a very just uplifted, more optimistic view on humanity. I, I yeah. know that. I just completely changed my optimism level. I used to be, you know, definitely pessimistic about the future, but I'm much more optimistic because we have the awesome people here. We have the freedom tech needed to progress these people to the next level. The Nostra and Bitcoin are the best place to start. And uh, I'm super stoked. I'm excited. I think that there's going to be more and more cool people coming out and, uh, I'm going to be sending them all this stuff. I'm going to mention all those those women you mentioned in the show notes, the podcast they have. Totally. To get, like speaking of like women having that human human connection, like podcasts, amazing fit. You know, totally. just being able to just totally just un unload with the ladies in like a one on one conversation. Like I've on your podcast, I've listened to this, and it's just I can sense just the femininity <laughs> oozing out of it. This is what you guys need, and it's just it's beautiful to watch. So. Ah, oh, thanks. It's fun. I know. I feel like I'm in a great sisterhood and I'm so grateful for all the women who inspire me and oops, shush, um, who inspire me and who, you know, who are my friends, you know, and teach me so many things and just include me. That's the thing that's really neat too, is like, it's such an inclusive group of humans, not just the men, not just the women. It's just like, come on, let's go build this beautiful world together, you know? So it's not some, you know, old stodgy boys club, you know, in Manhattan that only people, certain people are allowed in, you know, it's uh, -uh. everybody's, you know, the more the merrier. It's, it's fun. So I love it. Where can people go to follow you and get more Valerie amazingness? Ah, uh, you're so sweet. Yeah, I think everything's on djvaleriebeloved.com forward slash subscribe. You can see all the socials, all the, the podcasts, the YouTube. I'm trying to, you know, be more uh, self-promotion and getting my stuff out there. I changed the name of the podcast. It used to be Bitcoin for Peace and I just put it into my name because you know, one thing I did notice in, you know, the creative community and the activists a lot, the minute you say Bitcoin, they're like, ah, and they just don't even listen to it. And I'm just like, you guys, okay, if I have to, you know, just do my sly roundabout way and just talk, you know, just have it be my name. I'll just do that. I mean, it's just, we talk about love and the world and good stuff, but yeah, it's super, Super fun. But yeah, everything's under DJ Valerie B. Love. You can find me on all the ch socials and Noster over there too. If you go get an Noster account and say hello on Noster and I'll zap you. I'll zap you 111 sats. Okay. So go find DJ Valerie B. Love on Noster and you'll get, I'll send you your first Noster sats. I will too. <laughs> Everyone come in. We'll, we'll show you love. We'll get you started in the right place where you can be your whole, full, weird, amazing self. That's the coolest thing about it. Game changer. It's a game Valerie, changer. You rock so hard, my friend. Thank you so much for doing this. Appreciate you always. And uh, I look forward to keeping in touch and following more of your episodes and content. Yeah. And you too, Ben, you're doing great work out there. I love what you're putting out and you're helping younger folks understand like their health, their wellness, all the things that are really, really important to living their best lives. So keep rocking. And I'm so glad to know you. And thank you again so much. You're so cool. And I love where you're at. It looks really beautiful. So uh, out in the 
the mountains of southern Mexico right now. That's where oh, my internet cut out earlier. It's a little sketchy, but it's worth it. <laughs> oh man, it looks great. Well, yes. I hope you have a great time. I know I get to interview in 10 minutes. I'm interviewing Wyatt from the space in Denver. Ooh, so cool. this is going to be fun. I got I one in 10 minutes too. We're in grind mode right now. I love it. Like I I can feel we're both like, okay, like we need to go do this other thing. So <laughs> we're getting after it, man. This, this is the time to get after it and make yeah. the content, help the people, get people on board to the life raft of Bitcoin Noster. I'll talk to you soon. It's been an absolute pleasure. <laughs> All right. Thanks, my friend. Peace, love, and warm aloha, everybody. <laughs> Thanks again, Ben. Ciao. <laughs>